I'm afraid that tonight's topic is one you cannot avoid, even if you refuse to talk to politicians, uh, at least if you get any medical um, articles. I have put the title in quotation marks, healthcare reform, because that's what people call it. However, I think that healthcare was a term that was invented not too long ago to help put things over on people. It refers to everything in a $3.6 trillion enterprise, at least 30% of which, and probably a lot more, has nothing whatsoever to do with either health or with care, but is simply related to money and control. The uh, reform is something I think everybody's in favor of in the sense of the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation if it means getting rid of corruption and correcting errors. But I think what we're looking at today is a revolution. Uh, you know, these reformations were not about destroying the faith, but the revolution is about destroying Western civilization. And that's why I want to spend some time today talking about the philosophy and the history concerning medical ethics, because I think uh, medicine is kind of on the, on the leading edge of this revolution. It, the argument gets quite heated if you have certain views about this subject, you are cons considered unethical or immoral. And just this morning I ran across something that said, if you don't believe in Medicare for all, you are a traitor to humanity. That's pretty tough. Now, I think I'd like to say that if you would converse with me, you for, must first define your terms. And I think a lot of misdefinitions are going on today, so let's keep that in mind, especially if you're going to call me names. Um, in my past life, I was a geometry teacher. And it, that starts with definitions and with postulates. I mean, what a shock it was to me as a high school student. Here's the pinnacle of logic, and you're starting off with things you have to take on faith. Euclid's fifth postulate says that through a given point, one and only one line can be drawn that is parallel to a given line. People tried for centuries to prove this, and they failed. So what happens if you deny this, then you end up with a different geometry? Well, if not one line, how many? If it's elliptical geometry, it's zero. If it's hyperbolic geometry, it's an infinite number. So everything really depends on your starting assumptions. I think the most important theorem in history is Gödel's incompleteness theorem, dating back to about the 1930s. What Gödel did was he converted the liar's paradox, which says, I am lying, into a mathematical formulation and proved it. His thesis was called on formally undecidable propositions. And what it means is that not everything that is true is provable. You really have to take something on faith. You have to start with some assumptions. My very favorite method of proof in geometry is the indirect method, proof by contradiction, or the reductio ad absurdum, which was used to great effect by the French economist Frédéric Bastiat. Doesn't work so well today because so many things that would have been recognized as absurd before are now so politically correct that you dare not challenge them. But we'll maybe come to one example of this. This is my favorite metaphor for Medicare. If you build something on a bad foundation, this is what happens to it. And this is my metaphor for attempts to save Medicare. Those are 800 tons of lead counterweights that attempt to make the other side of the building sink so the building is less likely to fall down. But eventually that building is going to topple because all the masonry has been under abnormal forces for centuries. Now the thing to do when you have a building like this is not to load everybody else in the population into that building. What you really need to do is to evac evacuate the building so people don't get killed when it falls down. If we're going to talk about reforms or really anything in medicine, we need to have some outcomes measures. Those are very popular. Um, here are some that I took from a book called Critics of the Enlightenment. Believe it or not, there are critics of the Enlightenment. And these ask some basic questions about what you might call social determinants of health these days. Abandoned children, crime rates, lawsuits, prison population, good faith in commerce, 
an associate of mine who used to own the biggest body shop in New York City said he did everything based on a handshake. He even imported fiats from Italy based on a handshake. But now, if you take your car to a garage, you can't be sure they're not going to take a piece of it out and just hope you don't notice. And you can't do anything without having page after page of legalese. That's what's happened to our good faith. So I would say that based on these outcomes measurements, we are not in very good shape in our country today. And if we're going to talk about medical ethics, I think this is the man whose story is well worth reading. That is his picture for when he was in the dock at the doctor's trial without his uh, magnificent SS regalia. He became Hitler's private physician quite by happenstance. He did not start out to be a criminal. He was an extremely excellent orthopedic surgeon who saved many lives. He practiced lifeboat ethics. The question was, who do we feed? Our wounded soldiers or these chronic schizophrenics? And when the doctors asked, well, do we have to watch these patients starve to death slowly? Why don't we give them a death with dignity? And Karl Brandt signed off on, the, on those forms. And he, he did not consider himself to be a criminal. These are some references you might want to read, by the way. If you want some handouts, there are a few back there, or I can send you my PowerPoint slides later. On the gallows, he said, who are you to judge me? I was only serving the fatherland. And the medical ethics that he was following did not start with Hitler. It started decades before Hitler. Uh, who can tell me th the name of this great humanitarian? That was Otto von Bismarck. He was Kaiser Wilhelm's Iron Chancellor. He was the founding father of universal state-sponsored medicine. Um, the very first one. So if you're in single payer, he's your man. Um, it was popular. It took care of the poor. You could say it represented Christian charity. But the Iron Chancellor's motive was to increase the power of the Kaiser by making people dependent on him for relief of sickness and suffering. And so as the doctors were paying the um, they're being paid by the state. They were starting to be serving the state instead of their individual patients. And Leo Alexander who wrote a very famous article in 1949 in the New England Journal of Medicine about medicine under totalitarianism said, the big lesson to learn from the doctor's trial is we must never let doctors work for the government again. Well, Carl Brandt was tried at Nuremberg. This was a very interesting video, even though Alec Baldwin starred in it. He played a Supreme Court justice who presided over the trial, and he really um, reflected on the question of how do we make this something other than the victor pun punishing the vanquished? I mean, how can we put ourselves above this so that our law has some universal significance and will last through time? He chose this uh, courtroom in the, the uh, Ministry of Justice in Nuremberg because it said in the film, he found a placard with the Ten Commandments on it somewhere. Now, I'm sure it wasn't this one. This was the Ten Commandments from a woodcut from Nuremberg. And I really kind of doubt this story because the Nazis were extremely thorough. And I'll bet they were even better than American atheists at getting rid of the Ten Commandments from public building. But we do know what Hitler thought about them. He thought that they'd lost their validity and that conscience was a Jewish invention, a blemish like circumcision. He felt his National Socialist movement was a good thing, a great thing, a splendid thing. We are going to recreate mankind anew. And another dignitary who agreed with Hitler's assessment of the Ten Commandments of Friedrich Engels, one of the founders of Marxism, he said, thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet are examples of the dominant class trying to impose respect for property on the exploited masses. Everything in the Marxist paradigm is about class warfare. We reject any attempt to impose on us any moral dogma whatsoever. The Bible is a collection of fantastic legends without any scientific support. 
And Friedrich Engels, of course, is not the only person who thought that. Here's what I would consider to be a completely secular formulation of the Decalogue by financial advisor Richard Maybury. First, do all that you have agreed to do, and do not encroach on other persons or their property. I mean, isn't this like thou shalt not steal? Thou shalt not take anything that belongs to somebody else. His, his on, the honor that's due to him, his life, his spouse, his property, and maybe today we ought to add his liver or his kidneys or his heart, or his reputation, and so on. Well, what is the basis for that? Is there some sort of universal natural law? Well, to get rid of this and clear it out of the way, there have been efforts made in the past. Here was one revolution. Does anyone recognize that? This was the uh, uh, temple to the cult of reason at the time of the French Revolution. They threw Our Lady out of the Cathedral Notre Dame, got rid of the altar, and put up this altar to philosophy, and had women running about in Roman togas representing reason. But nobody remembers that as the symbol of the French Revolution. I'm sure you will recognize that. This represents the um, execution of Marie Antoinette. This was a kind of reparations. Now, she was born as an Austrian princess, Maria Antonia, the daughter of Maria Theresia, who was the empress of the late great Austro-Hungarian Empire. What did she have to do with centuries of French oppression? Nothing. What could she have done to help the peasants? Nothing. Did she care enough? Well, who knows, but she did not say, let them eat cake, but nevertheless, she had to die. And here was another victim of the reign of reason, science, and terror. This was Antoine Lavoisier, one of the world's greatest scientists. He was the father of modern chemistry. He debunked the phlogiston theory of combustion that had been settled science taught for centuries in medieval universities. He was also the first to talk about the carbon cycle. Um, the reason he had to die was that he was an aristocrat and once worked as a tax collector. It was so urgent to execute him that they wouldn't even allow him time to finish some experiments. Well, these days, uh, well, they didn't care about his uh, disrupting of science. But these days, there are radical extremists who actually talk about executing or at least imprisoning scientists who dare to disagree with what they consider to be settled science. And not a few of them have lost their livelihoods and their reputation because of this. There were big differences between the English Enlightenment and the French Enlightenment. The English Enlightenment was supposed to restore the rights of Englishmen and the French to destroy the old regime, uh, including religion and the monarchy. And the English Enlightenment had this idea of unalienable rights as to life, liberty, and property. That meant a 51% majority could not vote to take them away from you. The French Enlightenment was about liberty, equality, and fraternity. It was a seductive idea. Even Thomas Jefferson liked it for a while until he found out about the reign of terror. So revolution is, you know, tends to be a bloody and unpredictable thing. Uh, this is a very interesting book by Dennis Prager. You may know him as a conservative talk show host, but he is a Hebrew scholar, and he has taught Torah to um, persons of all religion and no religion for 40 years. And this book is just the Book of Exodus and Commentary. It's the titled God's Slavery and Freedom, and talks about how this is the foundation of Western civilization, is the foundation of our belief in freedom and the abolition of slavery. These are some of the ideas that I gleaned from his book, that there was a God who was beyond nature, that there was universal human rights, and that slavery was inherently wrong. And this was at a time when probably three quarters of human beings alive were in bondage. Moses' father-in-law, who was a Midianite priest, remarked that since the Decalogue was handed down in the wilderness, that this was the law that was meant for all of humanity for all times. Not like the dietary laws and the rest of the Torah that may have been to preserve the, 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 uh, the chosen people 
Um, this, these were for everybody and for always. It also had the idea in there, which was very different from the Code of Hammurabi, by the way, that neither the rich nor the poor should get preference before the law, that the law should apply equally to everybody. And of course, thou shalt not steal anything that belongs to another, which means that God sanctifies the idea of private property. There was an outright ban on the universal practice of human sacrifice, and it also emphasized that, that evil depends on lies, or mass evil depends on lies. Prager quotes uh, Hitler also, that we are fighting against the most ancient curse that humanity has brought on itself, like the Ten Commandments. Well, if we want to throw away Exodus or the Ten Commandments as a foundation of our morality, let's think of something else. And this is another book you might want to read uh, called The New Medicine and the Old Ethics by, by Albert Johnson, who is one of the founders of bioethics, which is all the rage these days. Um, found it to be a pretty interesting book. I think if I can show you this next thing here. This was um, the University of Arizona College of Medicine in the early days. I used to work in a lab right about there. You couldn't get, get to the place without passing that beautiful reflecting pond with the statue of Hippocrates in it. That is long gone. The statue's still there in an isolated courtyard somewhere. Well, not too many people see it. The oath is still on the pedestal, but the students at the College of Medicine write their own oath. And I really think that the traditional oath of Hippocrates is not used in any US medical schools today, or at least very few. Of course, Hippocrates was a pagan, and he starts off with the road, swears to Apollo, etc. But the oath of Hippocrates has been recognized as a good foundation for medical ethics throughout Christendom. And here is a copy of it that was found in the Vatican Library. Today we still talk about the Hippocratic Oath, and some schools use them, but they are all um, very much edited. Here's the additions and corrections. You're supposed to honor secular authority. The part about forbidding deadly drugs and abortion is just completely wiped out. No more I shall prescribe for the good of my patients, according to the best of my ability and judgment. No, I'm prescribing for the good of society, according to best practices. People talk all the time about the words, uh, first do no harm, but if you look at any of the ersatz oaths, which are quoted in some of the references at the end of this, you will not find those words. So I challenge you to find those words. And forget about keeping confidences. There's an AMA code of ethics, which is more than 500 pages long. Here are some of the features. A physician shall respect the law and if it's bad, you know, try to make some changes in it. Uh, but he has many other responsibilities in taking care of his patients. And he's supposed to balance his responsibilities to multiple stakeholders, no longer just for the good of my patient. And just, I saw this just a couple days ago. Here's a new, th new thing that physicians are supposed to do. They're supposed to have a truly ethical relationship with the planet, whatever that means. I'd like somebody to define that term for me. Uh, this is from the Physician's Charter on Medical Professionalism from the American Board of Internal Medicine. And it also has things in there about the doctor's supposed to improve access to care. And he's supposed to see about the just distribution of finite resources. And he's supposed to manage conflicts of interest, not have any, not have an exclusive dedication to his patient. Bioethics has some core principles. Patient autonomy. I'm not sure exactly what that means these days, especially since we're having all this controversy in California and New York about your ability to um, re not to withhold informed consent from vaccines. There's provider beneficence and non-maleficence. I don't know why they're both in there. And I guess this just means that you're supposed to have good intentions. Well, you know, maybe Carl Brandt had good intentions too. What does that mean, really? And then social justice. Bioethics is based on lifeboat ethics. And you'll find it all over there now. Of course, there are situations which are like being in a lifeboat that's about to capsize. 
But that's supposed to be rare. You're not supposed to, in, to cause situations like that. Like the Titanic, they had a problem because they deliberately did not have enough lifeboats for all of the passengers. Uh, you're not supposed to deliberately create scarcity. And bioethics seems to plan for that. And any socialist economy um, you know, will have scarcity because it does away with the incentive to produce. Uh, there are many, there are th a, at least a couple of papers I know, including Albert Johnson, that talks about the Good Samaritan. Supposed to be a wonderful example. You come by this guy who's left for dead in the ditch and you take care of him. Well, what about all the other people in the world? There are millions of people in the world who aren't getting medical care. How can you justify putting all of your resources into this one guy? You should be thinking about the other guys. This was the article that made me woke in a very different sense than what people mean it today. It was in 1978, I was a VA doctor, and I was uh, reading my Annals of Internal Medicine. I came across this article uh, called A Marxist View of Medical Care. Which, uh, and I really think that the American College of Physicians has basically accepted cultural Marxism. Um, this is the most honest manifestation of that I've ever seen. It says that, um, the Marxist paradigm went to, into eclipse in the early 20th century, maybe because they found out about the atrocities of Stalin and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot and those other guys. But now it's being revived. And he complained that medical ideology is, uh, helps to maintain class structures and, pat and patterns of do domination. So we've got to get rid of that. And he was against reformist reforms and in favor of non-reformist reforms because if you had reforms that tended to make things better for people, it, they would lose interest in revolution. And revolution is what it's all about. Um, the Marxists like to say that the public sector, private sector drains public resources and um, NHS in Britain or, or people who support that say, we really shouldn't allow doctors in private practice because it drains resources kind of forgetting that all the resources were produced by private individuals in the first place. They talk about the excellence deception. This is a bad thing. A medical model that teaches health workers to serve individual patients detracts attention from progressive social change. And what we really need is kind of a revolution to kind of bring these ideas up to date. You now know that that practitioners, whether it be physicians or non-physicians, whether they be the most experienced and best neurosurgeon in the country or, or just somebody barely finishing his residency, they get reimbursed based on the code, not based on the real value of their services. Zeke Emanuel, one of the architects of the Affordable Care Act, said we put too much emphasis on IQ. And the um, American Medical Colleges wants to change pre-med requirements, or is changing pre-med requirements. Who needs to know about organic chemistry or calculus? What we need is more diversity. And if you read things coming out of the medical schools, they're really, they're really talking about diversity and eliminating disparities and social justice. And there will be complaints about things such as black women have more postpartum hemorrhage than white women. And they don't mention that black women have a higher incidence of fibroids, which causes postpartum hemorrhage. And I don't care how virulent a racist you are, I don't think you can cause fibroids. But all this stuff about diversity and disparity, so many articles about that, I'd like to see some more articles about how to treat all of our patients better. For example, in this series, we had two patients presented in the last year or maybe two. One of scurvy and one of wet beriberi. Both were delayed diagnoses. Both of the patients could have died. Why aren't we discussing in the medical journals about the appalling nutritional status of a lot of our patients and asking questions like, oh, do I deep down in my heart have white privilege or, or subconscious racism, but how about, are we giving enough intravenous thiamine in the emergency room so that you know, our patients are, are well treated? So much emphasis on discrimination and disparities, I would highly recommend the latest book by the brilliant economist Thomas Sowell, who kind of deconstructs the idea that any time you see a, a distribution of things that's not in proportion to the population, it must be because some evil person is discriminating. 
I'll just make a little reductio ad absurdum out of that. Let's, let's, let's assume, A, that um, all, all um, maldistribution of occupations is because of discrimination. If we got rid of discrimination then, 80% of the lineup on an NFL team would be white and 50% would be female. And 50% of Navy pilots would be female. And 50% of high voltage linemen would be female. And you would say, that's ridiculous. Therefore, it cannot be that all the, uh, changes in re representation of the population are due to discrimination. But maybe there really are differences in people's abilities and interests. But so far, I haven't heard that discussion in the medical literature. Well, if we're going to look at these people who are giving us advice on ethics, let's look at their credentials. We all know we have to be credentials over and over again, that that's very important. Moses probably shouldn't have existed at all. He was supposed to be subjected to a post-term sex-selective abortion. Uh, Pharaoh had decreed that all male newborns were to be pitched into the Nile. Instead, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the Pharaoh's court, so he was no doubt well-educated. He was a fugitive from justice. Boy, what kind of record is that? He once killed an Egyptian who was abusing a Hebrew slave, and somebody saw him, so he beat it, and was a sheep herder for his father-in-law for 40 years. He heard this call from a burning bush that was not consumed, and he said, right in the book of Exodus, if I tell people that, nobody's going to believe me. And he was supposedly the author of five books, or was he? He led the only successful slave revolt in history. Remember, Spartacus was crucified along with all of his followers. And the slaves were freed in the West thanks to the efforts of white abolitionists who believed in the book of Exodus. And so did the slaves that they rescued. And they sang beautiful songs about the promised land, which we did too, believe it or not, when I was in the seventh grade chorus at Townsend Junior High School. So this has been accepted as the basis for civilization for a long time. But now we have Albert Johnson et al., all of these great bioethicists. Um, Johnson was formerly a priest, although I, I think that his works seem to indicate he's an agnostic now. But he has been a member of medical faculties, the presidential commissions, the Hastings Center, all kinds of boards and, and prestigious organizations. He's the author of many books and hundreds of articles. So he's, he's maybe our man, the one that we should listen to. I just have run across some really interesting things about the book of Ex Exodus, since you know, we have put a lot of emphasis on evidence. And this is, of, of, I found, a really a fascinating video of a man who was looking at the situation with archaeological evidence, because the mainstream academic archaeologists say Exodus could not have happened. There is no evidence for it in 1250 BC, about the time of the reign of Ramesses II. Therefore, it didn't happen. Therefore, it's all a lie. Therefore, it's all nonsense, so we should throw it out. But in fact, there is um, very interesting archaeological evidence about the events in the book of Exodus in 1250 BC, I mean, I'm sorry, 1450 BC, which would be 200 years earlier. And these archaeologists claim, well, we might be 10 years off in our um, dating, but we can't be off by two centuries, even though all our evidence is rags and tatters which is all that remains to us from the magnificent Egyptian civilization. Even Rabbi David Wolpe, who led one of the biggest uh, congregations, said that the story in the Bible is indefensible, but he doesn't care. Something that is not factual could still be true, but a lot of people do insist on, on the facts. And here's another one on the Moses controversy. And this one claims that Moses could not possibly have written the Torah because he didn't have a written language or an alphabet. We were taught in school that there was no alphabet until the Phoenicians developed it about 900 BC. But there are some carvings on the rocks that have been called Proto-Sinaitic or Proto-Canaanite script that some people suggest might be Hebrew 1.0 and that maybe Phoenician had been derived from that. In fact, 
there are experts in the language who say that these inscriptions can reasonably read as Hebrew and make sense. But of course, Moses could not possibly have written the Torah. But we let's remember that Newton invented the calculus so that he could write the Principia, that Luther created the common German language out of 200 or something uh, dialects so he could translate the Bible. And there were these two African boys, ages 14 and 10, who invented a new alphabet called Adlam, meaning the alphabet that will prevent a people from being lost, to preserve their native language. Well, then you have to ask, well, if not Moses, or some people say having something to do with Joseph, who came before Moses, who was, according to the Bible, was in charge of everything in Egypt, well, who, who did this? We do have authorship controversy concerning the second most widely read and translated author in history. People say that Stratford businessman couldn't possibly have written the works of Shakespeare because he didn't own a single book and he never went to Italy. But there's all kinds of, of scholarship and, and um, suggestions for who was Shakespeare. I think you can make a good case for um, Edward de Vere, who was the Earl of Oxford. But for Moses, well, it was written by other people much later. No specific suggestions. There were probably at least four of them, they say. This is one of my favorite um, children's books, Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling, from which you will learn how the elephant got his trunk and how the leopard got his spots and answers to a lot of other questions that scientists don't know anything about. And my very favorite one was about the alphabet. There was a little African girl, call her Taffy. She was on a trip with her daddy, and daddy broke his fishing spear. And she wanted to send a message home so that somebody would bring his second best spear. So she thought, I'll draw some pictures. But then she thought, well, maybe people won't understand them. So she invented the phonetic alphabet. As Kipling said, she discovered the great secret of the universe, that letters st stand for sounds. I mean, the alphabet was probably the, one of the most important inventions in history because it allowed, it was simple enough that almost everybody could learn to read it and understand it. And you could write down laws and history and complicated things, and people would understand them. So people would understand about daddy's spear and everything else. Well, this was back in the days when words meant something. They had a reliable definition. It was before Lewis Carroll and his Humpty Dumpty who said, words mean exactly what I want them to. Neither more nor less. It's all about who is to be master. That's all. And of course, before George Orwell's, George Orwell's um, um, Newspeak Dictionary. Well, of course, scientists would never just make up a story to answer a question when they don't know the answer. But this Orly Goldwasser, who is a very prominent Israeli archaeologist, said, well, Moses couldn't have written the Torah. But the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, was invented by a simple person, a herdsman. Let's call him Benny. And he'd like drawing things on rocks. And I, after I said that, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm hearing this. But I think that we have two paradigms that, we, that are in conflict today. And we need to make some assumptions, and our conclusions will follow from the assumptions. One is that there is an absolute objective truth out there. Both A and not A cannot be true. And there is a universal moral law. Whether it came from Moses or somebody else, there it is. And the alternative is, truth is whatever the party says it is, or whatever feels right to you. And the corollary turns out to be in history that might makes right. My favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra, said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And I think we need to take a fork off the road that we're going down now and take the road toward freedom in medicine. People often ask me, well, if you're not in favor of single payer or Medicare for all, what's your plan? And I have to say, well, you know, the answer to one bad central plan is not another central plan that I think the plan that we should consider is the let my people go plan. That we should have freedom for all instead of Medicare for all. And we do have some articles about that. And maybe we should consider a Medicare buy out instead of a buy in. 
mean, after all, how do you put a price on Medicare? People think, oh, it's really cheap, those Part B premiums, but they forget that they're only paying 25% of the cost, and the taxpayer's paying the other 75%, and that's just Medicare Part, part B. Uh, on the Freedom Plan, there are three ethical ways to pay for care. Cash, catastrophic insurance, or charity. Making somebody else pay your bill or stealing are not two of those possibilities. And if we're going to design a plan, I think we ought to follow my daddy's laws of contracting, that water doesn't run uphill and Friday's payday. You really can't, you really can't fight the laws of nature, and people do have to be paid. They're not your slaves. By the way, the Torah forbids withholding a worker's wages even overnight. None of this. File a claim and maybe we'll pay you in 90 days. If we're going to define some of the terms of free market, it does not mean predatory profiteering. A free market is something that's voluntary. Decisions are made by individual buyers and sellers. The buyer pays the seller directly and is responsible for it. Every transaction benefits both parties or it doesn't happen, and it's not a zero-sum game. You can continue creating value. There has to be honest price signals, which are now lacking really in medicine. Prices are set by mutual agreement, not by an AMA RUC committee or by the, a bureaucracy or by a managed care plan. And there is competition. That's the only way to get prices down. The state of the free market in the United States today is terrible. It's been bad for at least 40 years. About half of medical spending is already from the government, and 90% is paid for through a third party, introducing all kinds of opportunities for fraud and moral hazard. The sellers are placed at risk to try to overcome some of these problems, um, but that doesn't work that well. Insurers' payments to providers are kept secret. There are price controls and barriers to market entry. Some people object when I talk about socialism, saying, well, that means that the government owns all the means of production, and we're not talking about that here. But, you know, the Nazis, part of there was a contraction for socialism, and there, there was nominal private ownership. It's just that the government was in control of everything. Fundamental axiom, which sounds so nice and sweet, from each according to his means and to each according to his need, until you get down to who's defining those terms as to who gets what. Radical egalitarianism, nobody is allowed to have anything better than anybody else, except, of course, for the equivalent of the pigs on Orwell's animal farm. It's based on lies. It's failure rate in the United States, starting with Jamestown and the Massachusetts Bay Colony and going through all kinds of experiments, has been 100% and worldwide mortality about 100 million. But this time we think, well, technocracy will make it work. A lot of people think Medicare is wonderful. It's, and it's popular, and you know, everybody wants that. Well, John Atarian, who died prematurely, I think he was an economist, wrote this book, Social Security, False Consciousness and Crisis. Remember that Medicare is Title 18 of Social Security, starting with the argument for its constitutionality, which was based on the same rationale as the Affordable Care Act. It's a tax, it's just a tax. Ultimately, he said it was based on frightened submission to one of the worst acts of tyrannical bullying in the federal government's history. The lies about Social Security include that it's an annuity purchased by workers. You know, it's, it's, provide, it's a forced savings program for their old age. Well, it's a tax. It has a trust fund. Well, that's an accounting fiction. It's an entitlement. No, it's not. There is no contractual obligation. It depends on what Congress decides. It can decide to cancel it if it wanted to. And by the way, you lose your Social Security, all of it, including what you've already got, if you opt out of Medicare Part A. And there really, except for very few people, there is no insurance allowed that duplicates Medicare. Social Security is solvent. Well, that's a lie. It's fiscally unsound. It's a Ponzi scheme by design. And can it be saved? Well, the demographics prove that it just can't. You cannot expect two workers to, to support a retiree throughout his retirement. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was also based on lies. Um, I believe that Jonathan Gruber, the Center for American Progress, United Health Group, 
and the whole litany of people who were architect of this plan knew exactly what they were doing, even if the president and Congress couldn't figure it out. They say it's insurance, but it admittedly is a wealth redistribution plan. It's said to have tax credit, but these are really subsidies. These people don't owe any taxes if they're getting the credits. It's supposed to protect patients. It really protects the stakeholders whose stock values went up and up and up. The, the bit about keeping your plan or your doctor should have, been, should have been able to see through that. If you had read the first 20 pages of the plan, millions of people had their, their things canceled. It's supposed to promote evidence-based medicine. Well, the authorities determine what's the evidence, so it's really authority-based. Cost containment. You cannot lower costs if you load on more administrative functions. What we have is expenditure attempts to control expenditures through price controls and denial of care. It's supposed to improve health, but life expectancy in the U.S. Has been, de has been decreasing for three years in a row. Differences between insurance and what I would call socialized medicine, or you would call it single payer, or whatever you, the current maybe acceptable terminology is. Insurance is voluntary. The AMA used to say, the voluntary way is the American way. I don't think they say that anymore. Socialized medicine is compulsory. A lot of these plans are proposing they'll sign you up automatically if you don't like it. Insurance has risk-based premiums, not premiums based on ability to pay or in guaranteed issue community rating. Insurance is a legally enforceable contractual obligation not just a political promise. There's market competition versus political competition. Yes, shareholders do get a profit. If you invest in a business, you expect a return on your money. But socialism reward has rewards too and profits to the stakeholders. The first uh, insurance of a free economy makes wealth creation possible. It's not a zero-sum game. It's also a lie to say that other countries have single payer. Canada, perhaps, but in other countries, there is a private insurance market, which a lot of these plans, like Medicare, all would abolish uh, sooner or later. Um, there is out-of-pocket spending in the, in the US. It's really relatively low, which may be one reason why, why we spend so much, because it all seems to be other people's money. There are costs in free market versus a third party. And I could give you a number of examples to that. I think I'll slip over that now. But I think the results of the Affordable Care Act, or I say so-called Affordable Care Act, is the percentage of supposed healthcare workers who are doing administration is now half. Previously, it was a third, which is also far too many. The administrator to physician ratio is about nine to one. True insurance is outlawed although the Trump administration is trying to liberalize some of those rules. And this is the rather famous thing about the cost shift to bureaucracy, which began about the time that Medicare and Medicaid were enacted. One of the biggest features of the Affordable Care Act, and probably the main way in which the people have supposedly gained coverage, is through Medicaid managed care. This is a cash cow for managed care, which was even acknowledged by AM News back in 2010, that the managed care plans like Centene and so on, who have narrow networks, and you, don't, you can't find a doctor in the specialty you need within driving distance. Um, their stocks have really soared um, at the same time that they may not, because they get paid for everybody who's enrolled, whether they provide any care whatsoever. So what can doctors do? I would say don't enable them. Opt out, don't take their money. That's the only way to be sure that you can't be accused of fraud. Speak the truth, even if it's politically unpopular to do so, and don't support lies. Theodore Dalrymple was a, written a lot of great books. He is a British psychiatrist who does a lot of prison medicine. Uh, Anthony Daniels, I think is his real name. And he points out that a society of emasculated liars is very easy to control. So if they can get you to say things that really aren't true or even ridiculous, uh, it increases their control over you. 
The sine qua non of liberty is refusal to live by lies. Today there's a lot of pressure to say that geese are swan and swans are geese, but they're really not. And eventually the forts of folly will fall. So I said there are some more references you might want to look at. Um, if you have questions, you can email me, janeorientmd at gmail.com. And here are the answers to the CMB questions. Number one, something included in the Oath of Hippocrates, but not in the Physician's Charter, all of the above. Only the Oath of Hippocrates has doing no harm, prohibitions on abortion and euthanasia, and prescribing according to my judgment. Number two is also all of the above. The AMA Code of Ethics, but not in the Oath of Hippocrates, seek changes in laws contrary to the interests of patient, have re increased responsibilities to society and supporting access to medical care for all people, all of the above. By the way, the oath of Hippocrates, despite what some people think, has nothing in it about the doctor being obli obligated to take care of all comers and, to, and without pay. That's just not in there. Uh, which of the following is true of Medicare? Is C, there's no lockbox, there's no contract enforceable by law. Uh, the benefits are contingent on continued enrollment in Medicare Part A, and the trust fund solvency cannot be assured into the indefinite future. And number four, the most likely consequence of universal health care proposals is outlawing private insurance. I think Bernie Sanders says it will happen immediately. A lot of the others say it will happen eventually. Hillary Clinton tried to outlaw it in the Clinton Health Security Act. Um, and the Affordable Care Act kind of d avoids that, but uh, all these others would like to carry that out. And that is it. I have be glad to answer any questions.